So, if you can please be seated, everyone, and we will continue. <coughs> I would like to say very welcome back and I hope that you all had a nice, tasty lunch. <coughs> so, um, this afternoon we will start with a piece of music. Uh, with us from Antwerpen is the internationally awarded Swedish cellist, Mr. Jakob Kranji, who is also one of the founders of the Near Zone Emission Chamber Music Festival, Jana Festival Academy. And Jakob, he will play the prelude and the sarabande from the bass cello suit in G major. So, there he is, there you are. <laughs> an applause and welcome to Jakob, who will play for us.
Thank you so much, Jakob, for this fantastic and most lovely piece of music. Excellent, really, and we're so happy that you could join us from Antwerp here today. Um, I um, know that you are engaged in the uh, climate crisis since quite some time. Could you please tell us a little bit about how this engagement has altered your life as a musician? Yes, well, first of all, I'm very happy to, to be able to take part uh, today, even though I wasn't able to actually be physically at home in Stockholm. Um, and, uh, I mean, uh, your question relates exactly to that. I'm actually free today. Uh, I'm in between two jobs. I have about four days before, or between two jobs. But I stopped flying because it didn't, it simply did not feel reasonable to fly around at this moment in time when flying causes so much damage. And we all know that, but it's, it takes a while to actually come to, to um, it took me a while at least to, to actually come to that decision to, to, to actually act on my, <laughs> my beliefs, so to say. So today I could have flown back home and played for you in Stockholm, uh, but I'm very happy that, um, that you were actually willing to host me uh, digitally instead so that I could be there even though I don't fly. So that's, uh, this is actually a, a very good example of how it's affected my, my life as a musician um, because flying is by far, uh, in our business, um, it's by far the biggest uh, contributor to climate change. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I would also like to, to ask you, I know that you've started the Near Zero Emission Chamber Music uh, Festival, the Jana Festival Academy, and you did that together with uh, Peter Fries Johansson. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit uh, about it? I, I've uh, had the honor to listen to you before, but we have many people in the audience who ha haven't met you. So if you would please uh, tell us a bit. Well, it's an attempt to create uh, something, um, create a chamber music festival in the summer academy for students. Uh, on an international level, uh, the kind of festivals that I enjoy very much uh, being a guest at uh, around the world and uh, it is an attempt to create one that does not uh, pollute or almost does not pollute let's say so again the biggest thing for for us then is to uh, really ask our artists uh, in a as kind a way as possible to say that we would love for you to come it would be our pleasure to host you but we have to ask you to take the train or an electric car if so uh, even if they travel from southern europe or something and I would say I'm happily surprised uh, that most people agree to do so. Um, so that is one aspect of how we, we change the business model, so to say, of this festival. And, and it's, it's been very awarding to see how that actually affects other festivals and musicians around us. Uh, people do like, most people do. And if you see somebody do something, you are much more likely to do it yourself. Um, so it's an attempt to contribute to a more positive future uh, also on that side, sort of the arranging side of the musical business. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, when is the festival, the, the next one, to, to be held? Uh, it will start, um, well, it's quite soon, not even a month. It's on the 30th of June until the 6th, 6th of July in uh, the Cultural House in Ytterjärna. A wonderful oh. site. If you haven't been there yet, it's a really beautiful place. Is it open to the public or do you have to like, oh, buy yes. tickets or so in yeah, advance? Yeah, you have to or? buy tickets. If you're under 18, it's actually for free. Oh, okay. Uh, but um, you have to buy tickets. Otherwise. Oh, okay, okay. That's grand. But then you will be here uh, in Sweden when it takes place. Yes. Yes, okay. Well, we look fo forward to welcoming you back to Sweden uh, by train, uh, then I, I suppose. Yes. And uh, again, a big warm applause to, to Jacob for joining us here today and the best of luck with your future jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we will move on to uh, the next part in our program. And we will then welcome Mr. Marku Rumakainen, who is the Swedish IPCC focal contact and also climate advisor at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. 
Mr. Romakainen is professor in climatology at the University of Lund and he has been a part of the IPCC work since many years, among other things as the main author for the fifth IPCC report, assessment report number five. He has also been a UN expert in the climate negotiations since 2010. And moreover, he is a member of the Swedish Climate Council, Klimatpolitiska Rådet. <coughs> Mr. Ramakainen will talk about climate action, a challenge with solutions. So we are very happy to welcome you here, Mr. Ramakainen, if you can please come up on stage. Welcome. Thank Thank so you. the floor is yours and I'll just sit over here. Thank you. Where should I stand that I, did st that I don't uh, bother you the most? Here? Okay. Climate change, climate action, what we do about climate change is a challenge, but it's a challenge with solutions. And I believe that we need to keep in mind both dimensions, that it, it is here, we need to do something about it, and that we can do a lot about it. And I will come back to this during the presentation a few times. But still, to um, provide element to the setting the scene, climate change is ongoing. The global warming to date amounts to about 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to the pre-industrial or the latter part of the um, 19th century. Sea level is rising, Ice is melting in the Arctic, uh, in the Antarctic, uh, in, in mountain regions and so forth, permafrost is melting. And we also see more extremes which occur because of climate change, heat-related, water-related extremes. The uh, curve shows the global temperature evolution during the past couple of decades. And one see there's a weekly black line which is the global temperature affected by the rising trend or the warming trend with internal variations which are internal to the climate system when the atmosphere and ocean exchange heat with one another. And there's a simple ex extrapolation which one, shouldn't, one should not overinterpret when, when we might reach 1.5 degrees centigrade if things continue as they are going right now. And indeed, we could uh, reach 1.5 degree sometime in the 2030s already, but we do not have to. There's still, well, almost not, there's still some time, short a while of time when we can change the course of emissions, change the course of world development in an attempt to stay below or at most at 1.5 degree global change. And it matters because we already see climate impacts. And we know that climate impacts will increase with any, every increment of warming. There's a big difference in climate impacts between 1 and 1 1.5 degrees centigrade, and there's a big difference in climate impacts on humans and, and the nature between 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade, for example, and so forth. And we have the whole issue of tipping points, which is something that science knows about, but science can't really put its finger on when some kind of reorganization of the ocean currents or an unrelentless melting of the great ice sheets or something, or those kinds of events happen. Some may happen at 2 degrees centigrade, some may happen at 3 degrees centigrade, we don't know. It's an uncertainty which also should be factored in when we talk about climate, why we should do something about climate change. It's about climate action on mitigation reducing emissions, reducing warming, and other changes in the climate system, and through that, uh, avoiding impacts. It's also about adaptation of managing the impacts that we do not prevent by mitigation. Uh, impacts of sea level rise, impacts of rising temperature, in, in, impacts of increasing extremes, increasing precipitation, but also dry conditions, heat waves, and so forth. And of course, all of this is in turn connected to the overall sustainable development, which is expressed, for example, by the um, Sustainable Development Goals, where climate is one. But it's also clear 
by science and, and the rational mind, that one cannot do the sustainable development goals without addressing climate. But also that by addressing sustainable development goals, like uh, sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and so forth, it also provides great uh, utility solutions to mitigation and adaptation. The um, things don't look great in many ways. The uh, global emissions of greenhouse gases continue increasing. And the graph shows uh, the global emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, industrial gases from 1990 to 2019. One could add 2020 when there was a small dip in the global emissions because of the pandemic. Since then, the emissions have sort of rebounded, bounced back on the, um, on the earlier trend. 2019, the global emissions amounted to almost 60 billion metric tons carbon dioxide equivalents, the sum of all greenhouse gases. The um, 60 billion metric tons in 2019 is an increase of 12% since 2010, or it's an increase of more than 50% since 1990. Emissions are not uh, going down, they are still going up. The, um, of course, there are large differences between different countries. And there are also large differences between households. The richest, the poorest, um, have very different climate impacts. There are also, even though the global emissions are continuing to increase, there are some countries 18 or 20 or so, where emissions have decreased during the past 10 years compared to the earlier decade, uh, both if one re counts with territorial emissions within the country or also when looking at consumption-based emissions. Still, there are other things which are not going the right direction. For example, there are studies, and you have probably seen news articles as well, that the existing and close to being realized uh, planned infrastructure, which is about fossil fuels, will eat up the remaining carbon budget, which is possible if we want to aim to 1.5 degree temperature rise and no more, if this infrastructure is used as we have used in fact so far. But there are also an increasing number of positive signs. More and more countries are setting targets. They are putting forward pledges, both in the near term and long term, and if one is very, very optimistic, counts all these pledges from all the countries of the world, all the industries and, and businesses and, and civil society and so forth, it could mean that the global mean temperature rise, if they all come true, would be limited to 2 degrees centigrade or less, which of course is much better than 3 degrees, but not yet 1.5 degrees. More is needed. That's a clear science, message from the science, more is needed if we want to have the ambitious climate goals in sight. And there is less time today than just a few years ago. And I will show an example of that as well. The decisions which have been taken in the countries of the world, decisions that affect emission development one way or another one, point today to a global mean temperature rise during this century of around 3 degrees centigrade. And that is positive compared to if nothing had been done, if we had just continued as we always did, historical trends and so forth. The optimistic view, looking everything that has been put forward, not binding in all cases, would be about two degrees. And the graph there shows global carbon dioxide emissions from the near past to the end of the century. The black line uh, shows the historical emissions through the past few years, and the gray line, or the gray family of curves, if you like, would be the foreseen emissions uh, development in light of decisions made, made so far in the countries of the world. And this would lead to about 3 degrees centigrade. The um, green um, family of curves would be what would need to happen if we want to have some chance of limiting global mean temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and no more. And there are milestones for this one, this kind of development, which is possible in the light of science. It's possible in, in what we have financial resources. It's not even expensive in that case compared to what it generates as benefits. Um, it's 
possible in technological change terms and so forth. But for 1.5 degree, <coughs> looking at this whole travel from today to net zero emissions and, and so forth, the global emissions need to peak and start reducing before 2025. The global emissions need to be reduced about 48 percent to 2000 by 2030 compared to 2019. Net zero emissions need to be reached around early 2050s. And there needs to be some cleaning action, uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere net beyond 2050. And of course, this is not only about carbon dioxide, also other greenhouse gas emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, industrial gases also need to be reduced heavily. Methane, for example, by a third as early as by 2030. And this would give the world a 50% chance of not going over 1.5 degrees centigrade. Can we still do 1.5, which is a fairly new concept, has been around in essence, maybe the first five, six years or so, or from the Paris Agreement, uh, seven years or so. In 2018, the scientists putting forward the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree global warming described this path from today to the future and the 2030 milestone that the global emissions of carbon dioxide would need to be reduced by 45% to 2030 from compared to 2010. The latest uh, number on this one from this spring is that the reduction would need to be 48% to 2030 from 2019. And when we also put this that the global emissions have increased by 5 billion metric tons from 2010 to 2019, one can easily see that this means that more needs to be done during a shorter period of time. And one can put this in different ways. We have a smaller chance than before by doing as much as we can to stay below 1.5. We have a higher risk of going over. Uh, we have a larger dependency on being able in the future to generate net negative emissions. So, well, more needs to be done in a shorter one time today than if you just think about what applied a few years ago. There are things happening, of course, um, if you think about climate action. The global emissions growth has slowed down, which is, of course, positive. There are these sustained reductions in some countries, which I mentioned, for various reasons. There's a fall in cost of new solutions to replace the old fossil solutions. And the graph there showed the price development of solar power and wind power on land and in the ocean, or the ocean. And one can compare the price to the old solutions price, the fossil price, which is in the gray area, meaning that the new prices are falling below the old prices, which of course is also several reasons of doing action. Paris Agreement has catalyzed uh, action. The nationally determined contributions, for example, has led to these increasing numbers of pledges, a process of following up on how they, how they work. Climate laws about that concern emissions now in more than 50 countries. And also today, low climate action can take you to court, as has been happened in, for example, Germany and the Netherlands, where the government actually has been told by the court that you have to increase your climate ambition. Um, and this is possible <coughs> in, in many terms. It's not about the lack of solution. Many options are around to reduce emissions already by 2030 and also in the longer term. And it's not expensive. The global cost is not excessive. The global cost actually be negative depending on if you look at the monetary impacts, but also the non-monetary non benefits of better livelihoods, uh, of development in the world, of protection, nature and so forth. The cost will, it will be different in different countries and sectors, which also is something to deal with. Looking at the options by 2030, it's much about solar power, it's much about wind power, it's much about electrification, it's much about doing things more effectively. But to have the global emissions by 2030, which is one of the milestones for 1.5, as, as you recall, 
the cost would be up to or less than 100 US dollars per ton greenhouse gases. So about a thousand crowns or so. Half of the half would cost less than 20 US dollars per ton, 200 crowns or so, which is not in my mind excessive. And a quite a number of solutions have a negative cost, meaning that they are cheaper than we would otherwise choose to do uh, old technology rather than new technology. But it's also important to keep in mind that even though the emissions are there where production is, um, emissions come from factories, they come from cars, they come from clearing forests and so forth. There's a great potential on the demand side whose individuals, whose different uh, with different organizations to actually make the originators, the industries, the, the, the land use, all those things uh, to reduce the emissions by changing demand, which can be about which about choices, its behavior, its lifestyle, is what we eat, how we transport ourselves, um, how many times we can use a certain product, how material is going around, what we recycle, what we reuse, how we require eff more effective appliances and so forth. And by some estimates which have been put forward, the demand side could actually effectuate somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of the global emission reductions, even though they of course have to occur where the emissions occur, industry, land use and so forth and so forth. But the driving force can come from the demand side. Carbon dioxide removal, it's a long chapter, I'm not going to go there now. But what it's about, it's not about that we know what it's about, that this is a problem. We, it's not about that there are solutions, it's about enabling the change, enabling us to take these good solutions aboard, enabling us to pursue sustainable development, climate action and so forth. It's about leadership, it's about mining climate justice and equity in the world, but also within countries and, and between groups. It's doing things effectively, synergies, we do this, we rest restore the ecosystem, we provide for ecosystem produ production protection, but we also can actually have mitigation and also adaptation. International cooperation, multi-level co 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 cooperation, multi-level governments, the governments enabling municipalities, municipalities contributing to, to the national goals and so forth. And of course, about directing or redirecting finan financial resources, about technological resources and, and policies and so forth. Summing up, time is running. There is still time to do a lot. We cannot avoid all of climate change. We are already living climate change, but there is still time to do a lot. A lot can be done, not least if we enable the decisions, the applications. Doing so has many benefits. When you work, do climate action, you also do sustainable development action on several fronts. Time is running out for the most ambitious climate targets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco, for this. Um, it's kind of gloomy, isn't it? Um, Both end. Yeah, but there is time. Uh, would you please have a seat here? And I, I have some questions for you. Um, I <sighs> now, <coughs> um, first of all, thank you for this very interesting presentation that you uh, gave us. And uh, you have presented some solutions uh, to the climate crisis. And we haven't seen enough action yet, despite many international commitments and conventions, resolutions and, and so on. And you, you've been um, a part of the climate nego negotiations now for uh, more than a decade. What would you say are the main obstacles? Well, um, different countries are in different places. Um, some countries take the historical view, I mean, who, who brought us here? Uh, who has developed so far, um, what about our rights. Um, different countries are vulnerable to climate change in different ways, uh, adaptation needs are different, um, 
financial resources are in one part of the world, uh, not another part of the world. I mean, different countries are in different places, and of course they want this to be acknowledged. And it is also in the guiding principles of the negotiations. But the practice is sometimes a bit more difficult of how to acknowledge this and what is the right division of responsibility or what is the right solution and what is the right amount of, of support, for example. Is the is the like um, I, I suppose there are tensions if we, if we take like the the richer countries uh, and then we have the developing countries are are would you say that the the obstacles are more on the richer side that we don't want to or are as um, uh, positive to to do the sacrifice and the change that we need to do to reduce different emissions and. Uh, you know, change our way of life we, because we're used to do this and do that and buy things and, and travel here and there and so on. And if you compare that to uh, the developing countries who, well, you've had yours, uh, you, you've done this and that, now it's our turn and so on. What would you say? Is there a, like a, a, a balance somehow or where could you kind of identify uh, the, the problem more like uh, in the, these uh, different circumstances that you have in the countries? Well, I, I'd say there's sort of legitimate issues and concerns from both sides. That of course, the um, countries who are worst off would like to be more, would like to have more support. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, the countries that provide support would like to have feedback on what mm. the support was used for, which sort of provides a rep reporting obligation, which some countries might not have the capacity to do. To do or they might say that we are a sovereign country; we should be able to know best how, to, how we use these funds. So, I mean, that's one sort of a friction point, if you like, in, in, the, in this case. Um, but I mean, there are different issues, tec maybe technical issues, but they're also principal issues, or I mean, what is, we all know what justice is about, right? But if you want to quantify justice, mm -hmm. what is the right quantification? Or how, how far back in time you should go and see that who is responsible for climate change so far? Is it all the way back to when emissions started or is it all the way back to when we knew that emissions would have a climate impact, for example? I mean, again, there can be different points of view which scientifically can be mm. fine. So it's more a value judgment or, or valuation of mm. these different points of view. And, and these things, of course, be there. Overall, I mean, the, I think the world is pretty much in agreement that we have a problem and, and we want to solve it and we need to reduce emissions and, and provide for adaptation. Mm. But then on low on other levels there's a lot yeah. of things to discuss. Oh yeah, I understand. So uh, also you, you spoke a bit about this window that there's still, t there's still time. It's running out but there is still time. And this window of opportunity that is getting smaller uh, and when it comes to our possibilities then to, to bend the curve and halt climate change. but how narrow would you say that it is? And uh, what happens if the emissions aren't reduced in the nearest couple of years? Well, in a way, I mean, scientifically speaking, uh, I mean, there's always time. Mm. But the challenge becomes more and more difficult and less and less conceivable that we actually can reach it when time passes and we don't do enough things fast enough and so forth. I mean, these milestones that I showed from science, they apply for a probability of 50% of actually reaching, as a, not going over 1.5. If we wait a few years, then the science could say that, well, yeah, sure, I mean, we can perhaps have a 30% probability of doing 1.5 if we start acting now, um, which I mean, the probabilities are not always discussed so extensively that what it actually means and means. Or if we don't bend the curve now, then we have to do much more negative emissions and there are question marks of how much we can do with that and whether that's a, a clever way to, to go. Mm. So the sort of the, the solution space changes mm. depending on when we start doing more. Mm. And of course, the likelihood of doing the more ambitious targets reduced mm. is reduced. What would you say, like lastly, now we have the meeting here uh, starting tomorrow, and if you could look into the crystal ball, <laughs> um, what, what, what are your predictions? What do you, what do you think about the future when it comes to, to this? Uh, is, would you say that there is enough political will? Is, can we, what shall we do to, to make this happen? How can we as civil society mm. 
contribute and, and so on? Many questions in one sentence. <laughs> I'm sorry. But well, I choose to sort of look at these two sides of the coin that we have a problem, but we also have ways that we can do a lot about it. And I see that it's going slowly, but it has started to turn. Then how fast it continues to turn towards the solutions that remains to be seen. Individuals cannot solve it by themselves, mm. even though if, I mean, one person can do only so much, more per people can do more, of course. But again, the individual works in with it within solution or, or choice space which the society provides. Um, but the individual action, as I showed this, uh, th the estimate of the demand side potential, that it can sort of pull uh, the, the primary emission sectors to reduce emissions mm -hmm. by active choices, which actually generate many benefits, mm -hmm. uh, not only climate benefits. Mm -hmm. So individuals have a power of a, a part of the solution. And it is also so, of course, that if not everybody pitches in, we won't get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, may, it may sound a bit sort of, uh, but um, that's it. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Marko Rumekainen, for joining us here today. So we have a little gift on its way before you oh. leave the stage. So there you go. Thank you so much. It's uh, symbolic. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And good luck with your important work best practice uh, for the project on the island of Pemba in Tanzania uh, and also how the United Nations Association of Finland works in Finland. So it's my great pleasure to give a warm welcome to Mr. Reinald Maeda uh, and to Ms. Jenny Kaupila. <laughs> An applause. And uh, I will now hand over to my dear colleague Michaela who will moderate the session. So. Thank you very much, Anneli. Yes, and very welcome to you. Um, yeah, so the name of this panel is Civil Society Partnership for Implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, I will start from the beginning. I mean, we are all United Nations associations and we have a lot of things in common. One thing that we all have in common is that our mission is to bring people closer to the UN. But this is a two-way street. We also need to bring the UN closer to the people. And bridging this gap is very important. Pushing governments and the UN to become more inclusive, more transparent and more democratic and what we have been talking about today, act for, um, for a better environment. The vision uh, of many uh, of uh, United Nations Association and for Sweden, uh, Swedish UNA, um, is a strong UN movement promoting human rights, sustainable development and peace. And for this, we do need, it's crucial that we have a vibrant civil society and strong UN movement and a UNA movement working from the bottom and up uh, for example, you and Sweden, we are working in local chapters with schools, we are working with municipalities. And with this, we are we enable uh, to put forward the people's perspective, which is also the name of this conference. We also have an important mission to safeguard multilateralism and international partnership. And uh, in the spirit of partnership, I will hand over, over to my dear colleague, Jenny Kaupila, who will present to you the work that has been done in Finland to, uh, for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Mikaela. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I must say that I have been really inspired during the conference yesterday and the talks today uh, by the previous speakers. And I'm honored to be here sharing our examples from Finland. Um, today I will focus mostly on the national framework um, that we have for sustainable development implementation. And um, in the first slide, um, please uh, go ahead. Oh, oh, I can change it myself. Wow. <laughs> Be active. Mm -hmm. um, 
here we can see the um, sustainable development goals. They are all interlinked, as we have heard here, but they have the common environmental base. So that's why we have the green um, base in our visualization of the uh, sustainable development goals. So without the ecological base, we will not have uh, sustainable social or economic growth. And the reason why we have uh, pictured this as a puzzle is that um, it doesn't really matter like from which angle you enter the house, um, you'll see all the 17 goals and you need, need to put the pieces together yourself. So everybody is needed. Uh, that's the UNA Finland approach to sustainable development. Uh, the Finnish um, national SDG implementation happens uh, coordinated through the Sustainable Development um, Committee. It is um, chaired by the Prime Minister, currently Sanna Marin. And uh, it's a multi-stakeholder um, commission having um, over uh, 100 participants, um, NGOs, uh, trade unions, uh, businesses, um, um, the Sami people, um, the Orland uh, <laughs> Autonomic um, um, Island. And, and there's also inter-ministerial coordination network that um, then is um, in close contact with the secretariat that is running, running the Sustainable Development Committee. And uh, in addition to that, we have um, some innovations that I want to mention. We have now science panel on SDGs. It's an independent panel um, consisting of um, um, around um, eight scientists, I think, from different fields, uh, from natural sciences to education, uh, social sciences, uh, economics and so forth. So they uh, produce their own independent uh, recommendations and, and discuss that together with the um, Sustainable Development Committee sec Secretariat and the duty pairs in Finland. And then in addition to that, we have a separate uh, climate change panel, uh, also um, consisting of uh, scientists and uh, with a youth representation pre in it. And youth have um, their own group, a youth agenda uh, 2030. Um, they are between 15 and 28 years old. Um, around 15 youth, depending on the like the uh, on the year, and um, they are like um, the critical friend uh, of the secretariat. That's um, so they are uh, telling the secretariat um, uh, like, are they um, ambitious enough? Uh, what needs to be done more? And they they take part in the ministerial uh, discussions as well. And then we have conducted two times citizen panel. So. It's a survey um, done um, in, in Finland overall, and then focus group uh, research, like um, to dive in deep um, in the questions that are, that are raising from the citizen side. And um, societal commitment um, is a possibility for everybody to make their own commitments, uh, make them public, give the measurements, how are you are following uh, and reporting it. So it's uh, for individuals, to NGOs, to companies, schools, whoever wants to do that. And lastly, I would mention the voluntary national reviews, um, which, as you know, is the main mechanism how uh, countries report um, at the UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. It takes place in New York every year. Uh, we did our first in uh, 2016, a year after um, the Sustainable Development Goals were um, uh, taken, taken uh, into action, and the second was one was in 2020. And in 2020, um, the civil society organized our independent report. Um, so we would give our opinion into each of the goals, how we are succeeding in Finland, and it would be it was published as part of the official report. So in one page, it would be the government um, view how we are doing, and on the second page, it would be the civil society view. So that was. Uh, like one example of um, of the critical voices of civil society being heard. Okay, um, these are the key uh, policies. I will not go so much into it. Just mention that our governmental program is based on uh, Agenda 2030, and um, then we have a new national roadmap uh, that will guide us now up to 2030. Uh, it was just um, launched, and it's based on. Uh, on the need uh, for systemic change. We have heard a lot about systemic change here. And also in Finland, we have identified six uh, transformation areas, which are um, economy, 
education, uh, well-being and health and social inclusion, food systems, natural resources and sustainable energy systems. So much in line uh, with, uh, with the, for example, what we heard previously. Uh, and then, most importantly for us as UNAs, uh, there's a support for global implementation. So um, that's a separate component uh, that is monitored under the Finnish um, uh, roadmap and now the strategy. And lastly, I would like to mention something that relates to the spe speeches from yesterday. We heard from Uppsala, for example. And uh, the local uh, reviews um, are like national reviews, but they are done within city level. And now, um, as part of our project between uh, UNA Tanzania, we'll be supporting um, the local review made by Tampere in Finland, um, which is a, a friend friendship city with Wansa in Tanzania. And uh, we'll start to twin in this process uh, as uh, NGOs as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. And uh, yeah, I think we will move forward to you, Reynald. Uh, you will tell us a bit more about how UNA Tanzania have been working for implementation of the sustainable development goals, focusing on inclusion of marginalized groups uh, and vulnerable groups in decision making. So please, do you want to stand? Yeah. Yeah, and you had the okay. clicker over there. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I am uh, glad to be here, the, um, attending the Stockholm Plus 50. I was here uh, in 2012 at the Stockholm Plus 40 as a youth delegate. I had just started volunteering for the UNA of Tanzania, and I was selected to participate actually as part of uh, UNA Sweden's uh, program mm. uh, as a youth delegate. Uh, I am the, now the Secretary General of the United Nations Association of Tanzania. So. Um, I'm going to present about uh, the Tanzania uh, framework uh, for sustainable development uh, uh, goals. So this is the national uh, coordination. F we have the national coordination framework that is under the Ministry of Finance and Planning. Um, it was just launched in 2020. It, it's, it was a bit late, but uh, it's better late than never. Uh, we were part of, um, the UNA of Tanzania was part of the task force that was uh, participated in uh, creating uh, the structure you, you, you're seeing there. So you have the interministerial committee, uh, technical committee, the, the whole part, the three parts up there is, is just government departments. And then you have the National uh, Coordination Task Force. There you see the sustainable development platform. So this is where uh, we come in. The rest is just you know, government uh, departments and stakeholders like the UN uh, development groups, academia. So the next question is literally how civil society uh, organizes in Tanzania in um, implementation, monitoring, and follow-up on sustainable development. So we use sustainable development purposely, not only the goals, because we also have the Agenda 2063. Uh, this is the Africa, uh, the Africa we want. So it's like kind of uh, the SDGs, but for Africa. Uh, we also subscribe to the East Africa uh, regional uh, vision uh, for development. So we chose to have sustainable development so we can incorporate all these uh, development agenda, the global, regional, and uh, uh, to the East Africa cooperation. So the Tanzania Sustainable Development Platform is the civil society uh, platform that we as uh, UNA Tanzania convenes. Mm -hmm. So we have around 380 uh, civil society members. It's a voluntary platform. So we come together to share experiences on how, what civil society contributes uh, in the implementation, monitoring, and follow-up of sustainable development in Tanzania. So we are part of the National SDGs Task Force. We also participate in um, the VNR uh, process in 2019. That was the first time Tanzania reported, and we are also reporting uh, next year, and this process we have started. Uh, just like UNA Finland, uh, we participated in the national report, and we also have a civil society report in 2019 that we uh, developed with uh, members of the platform. 
Um, the challenge then was we had a very restrictive uh, statistic or uh, statistics law. Mm -hmm. So we could not really use uh, data that was produced by stakeholders like civil society in the report. So that was a bit restrictive uh, in the production of the report. But uh, luckily that law was amended and uh, hopefully next year we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to to do more. So from here is a lot of pictures uh, how civil society coordinates uh, in Tanzania. Uh, that is uh, a high-level panel at uh, Tanzania Civil Society Week. This is a, a big uh, event in Tanzania that we, we uh, also organize to see what is the contribution of civil society in national uh, development. So last year that was uh, me presenting um, the report just after uh, we finished uh, uh, creating the Nash, participating in the National uh, Development Plan 3. But we also have what we call the Parliamentary Group uh, on Sustainable Development. So this is also, I would like to also mention, uh, these initiatives are part of the cooperation we have with the UN of Finland and the UN of Sweden. So this uh, group was created in 2018. And there you have the national, uh, the parliamentary, uh, the national speaker of the parliament launching uh, the group. It has 35 members. They are all champions of SDGs uh, in the in the parliament, and they, you know, champion different causes uh, in the parliament. Now, uh, just rushing into now the <laughs> the climate uh, work that we do. Uh, in Pemba. So if you don't know, Pemba is one part of the islands of Zanzibar. So we also, like Zanzibar is, is famous, but uh, it's two islands that makes uh, Zanzibar. So Pemba is a much smaller island. So we started this work in um, 2016. And um, our mission is to inspire communities to take action. We just facilitate. So we create uh, understanding of environmental climate change and sustainability issues, but we let communities decide on the kind of action they want to take. So as you see in the picture, it's during what we call a community workshop. Um, the community is visualizing um, the kind of uh, society they want. So it's a village called Kengeja. And I have one minute. Oh. <laughs> so this is um, the communities visualizing what they want to see uh, in the future. Um, fast forward, uh, 2021. This area was uh, all salt water. Uh, this is a drawn picture by our communications team, but um, this area is all uh, farmland that is uh, intruded by salt water, uh, ocean water. Um, as you can see, these are mangroves uh, planted by the community uh, members to prevent uh, salt water from further uh, intruding the farmlands. And also this is part of uh, initiatives that we support uh, by providing mangroves. So you, you, the community uh, participates uh, in the uh, uh, tree planting, uh, planting activities. Um, this is the women group, uh, environmental group that we support uh, in Pemba. And this is one of the uh, activities that we, uh, we, we've done. We uh, planted 10,000 uh, mangrove trees uh, in the last year. And uh, there is also youth uh, uh, influencing uh, national level de uh, development processes. I had to use my picture there. <laughs> but uh, this is also part of that, Michaela, one minute. I would just like to also highlight what we are, uh, we are doing next uh, with young people and uh, climate resilience innovation. Um, so we are uh, planning hackathons. Uh, and this is just to see uh, what solutions uh, young people in Tanzania have when it comes to you know, uh, climate change uh, uh, challenges. So they are, we want to see home-based, context-based uh, solutions from young people. So this is our next step uh, that we are going to do uh, when it comes to climate resilience. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you very much. Uh,
Thank you so much, Reynald, for highlighting some results of your projects. For example, stopping saltwater intrusion by planting trees on the island of Pemba and community dialogue there. It was really interesting to hear. Uh, my question for you uh, is what were the obstacles and the success factors? You already mentioned the lack of um, reliable statistics as one of the uh, obstacles to to ensure effective interventions. Were there any other obstacles and what were the success factors for your projects? Um, thank you. Uh, one of the success factors is that when you do, when we work, we say community-led climate action, is that we let uh, the communities decide. For instance, we did not decide the mangroves uh, 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 restoration as part of the solution. The, the communities, uh, uh, said the challenge was that uh, people cut mangroves for domestic use, so they need to uh, solutions that you know restore the mangroves that were uh, cut for dom domestic use, but also have restrictive measures like bylaws uh, to stop uh, you know human, uh, like uh, people from cut, the members of communities from cutting mangroves mm -hmm. for building for firewood. Mm -hmm. So the success factor was these solutions were proposed by the communities themse mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So really it's not imposed in any ways. Um, and that's, what you s that's uh, how you see that after we left in 2016, um, they went ahead and uh, one of the areas that was heavily affected, mm -hmm. and they started community um, initiatives to to mm -hmm. plant, uh, to restore the mangroves mm -hmm. themselves. Um, the challenge now, when you have advocacy capacity building uh, kind of initiatives, and they propose solutions, they also need support mm. to implement these solutions. And there's only so much you can do, and that is actually heartbreaking because uh, they have these wonderful uh, solutions and mm. you can only help so much, yeah. like you, you just contribute. Yeah. For instance, Those one of the I things... Okay, the last thing. Uh, last thing, Michaela, <laughs> uh, was um, they plant rice. Mm. Most of the uh, little farm land mm. that is intruded by salt water, they used to plant like small uh, plots of rice, mm. uh, farm ri uh, rice farms. And then they use uh, seedlings that take, I think, eight months, mm. six, eight months to, to, to mature. Mm. They know that they need uh, seedlings that take maybe two, three, four months. Mm. But then they say, we know this, mm. but you still need uh, subsidies to mm. get these new kind of seedlings. So that actually is the big uh, uh, challenge, mm. that you can raise awareness, mm. but then if you just end there, mm. It's, it's actually, yeah. yeah. And you've been doing a great work, both in capacitating and supporting local actors in this. And uh, we're running short of time, so I will direct my next question right to you, uh, Jenny. What's your call to action, speaking as a civil society organization today? Well, I think the phrase, um, we have s whole of society problems, we need whole of society solutions, mm -hmm. is um, a catchy one. Uh, I'm going to grab that from this uh, meeting. But I have a few things that as CSOs we should do. Uh, we should call for policy coherence. We have heard a lot about the commitments that have been made. We know that we have great policies, um, they need to be implemented. Uh, at the moment, I just uh, maybe raise one. Um, we are spending um, 1.8 trillion US dollars per year on environmentally harmful subsidies. While we know that we need uh, lots of additional funding um, to meet the SDGs, now with the increasing global um, food finance and fuel mm. um, crisis, and um, which um, has now the Russian um, aggression to Ukraine mm. has um, also highlighted um, mm. the connection between human rights and the environment and, and the need to um, uh, get uh, rid of the <laughs> fossil fuel uh, mm. dependency. So, um, yeah, I think we, we also see like um, the need for active civil society to uh, monitor mm. um, the duty bearers and uh, to act for the um, coherent um, policies. Mm. 
Thank you very much for those final words. And thank you very much to Jenny Kaupila, Advocacy Officer in UNA Finland, and Raylan Maeda, a Security General at UNA Tanzania. Some olive oil. Thank you. And some olive oil for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michaela, and thank you also to our partners in Finland and Tanzania. So, after these uh, good examples from Tanzania and Finland, we will continue by getting to know further good examples from the Red Cross. A warm welcome to Ms. Nini Ikkala Nyman, who is Senior Officer on Nature-Based Solutions from the International Federation of Red Cross, and Ms. Eva Maria Rudbeck from the Red Cross Logistics Second Hand in Sweden, uh, who will tell us about your work with nature-based solutions in... No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So, Ms. Nyman, you will tell us about your work with nature-based solutions in Vietnam. And you, Ms. Rudbeck, you will tell us about uh, second-hand uh, uh, work here in Sweden. So I will start with Ms. Nyman by giving you the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and is this... Uh, yeah, it okay. Do you want me to present from here? Or? It's up to you. Where you I okay. You yeah, maybe I will go through there. I'll just check this. Okay, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about what's the role of nature and why does the Red Cross as a humanitarian organization work with nature? And really starting to understand how the way we manage nature, the, whether we protect it or not, um, can actually, if we're looking at a planetary crisis of climate change, of biodiversity loss and pollution, if we don't manage those problems, we're actually looking at humanitarian crises. Why is that? And in particular, what are some of the things that we can do to address that? And so just to start us off, and I think many of you are probably familiar with this, is just what is our understanding of what is nature and this other word that we often hear, ecosystems. Um, and that's really kind of the basis of understanding the importance of um, natural resources to us. So when we talk about nature, we're mainly talking about air, earth, trees, plants, animals. And when we talk about ecosystems, that's really more how those all interact together. So how water interacts with soil. How does the nature around us interact with people, with societies, in a broader landscape and an ecosystem? And it's that broader perspective that we need to start identifying solutions of some of the environmental problems we're facing. Seeing if this switches over. Technical issues. Um, there we go. Oh. So this concept of ecosystem services takes us to understanding of how nature can promote human well-being. It can provide benefits to humanity. And so there we can see some of these key natural resources, soil, earth, water, air, um, and these benefits that really range from a range of things. So whether we get food from nature, whether we get water, we get medicines, fodder, fuel, these direct goods, or whether we're talking about the function of nature in regulating climate, um, protecting us from climate change, or if we're talking about economic benefits that you can get from, from natural services, or um, in, in the case of human well-being, whether we're talking about health benefits or mental health benefits that you can be getting from nature. And when we look at these drivers of change, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about consumption, which my colleague Eva Maria is going to be referring to in, in a moment, urbanization, um, all these range of issues which undermine those services that we get from nature. And so it's not just nature for nature's sake, it's those essential pillars that they provide for society and for human existence. And so when we start looking at what are some of the solutions we can do, how can we actually work with nature to avoid some of these problems? How we can work with nature to provide better human well-being? There's this new concept. I'm not sure, where, where should I be pointing? It's kind of stuck. Should we try this? There we go. Sorry. 
what and why are nature-based solutions. So these are the actions we use on how we protect nature, how we manage nature, or we restore nature that's been degraded in a way that it provides societal benefits, it addresses human well-being, whilst also providing benefits to biodiversity. And I'm going to be giving a few examples uh, on that moving forward. And so this picture starts to show a bit what we talk about nature-based solutions and what I was mentioning before, this ecosystem. How does it all come together in a broader landscape? So um, Reynold was just giving the example of um, in coastal zones, ma restoring mangroves can provide, for example, coastal protection against storm surges, which are increasing due to, to sea level rise and climate change. Um, it can provide local fisheries for local communities. If we're looking at that forest area, we might be looking at how forests s reduce soil erosion and, and capture soil so that we have less landslides and slopes. Or we might be looking at sustainable agriculture as a way of doing agriculture that helps conserve soil, water, provides food security and economic security for local communities. And even in urban areas where we are now in a big city, we might be looking at the role of green spaces or green belts and how they, for example, can uh, reduce flooding and provide storage of floodwaters, which we don't get if, if we're in a concrete um, environment. So those are basically nature-based solutions where we start looking at how this all comes together, how we manage nature for these benefits. And these benefits indeed can be multiple. And so when we talk about social challenges that we can address through working with nature, there's a number of key societal challenges we can address. One is climate change, so whether we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions through um, maintaining trees or forests or through mangroves as well that capture carbon, whether we're looking at adapting to the impacts of climate change, so for example, using sustainable agriculture to, to be able to um, better manage food security during periods of drought, um, um, whether we're looking at uh, water security through how we manage watersheds, whether we're looking at the health benefits, uh, that clean air that we get from, from a healthy landscape or a green area, or the direct economic benefits that communities can get. The mysterious clicker. Wonderful. Okay. So these are just a few examples of the types of figures and benefits that we can get through these so-called nature-based solutions. So um, some studies show that by reforesting in an upper watershed, we can reduce um, flooding by up to 80%. If we are looking at the potential of mangroves, a 500-meter mangrove per belt can protect up to 50 to 100 uh, percent less impact of, of waves um, and uh, that, that are impacting the community. Um, figures like this of one third of, of people on the planet uh, depend on forests for their lives and livelihoods. These are huge numbers of how dependent we are on, on the environment around us. And if we're talking about um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, the potential of trees, mangroves, seagrasses, vegetation, um, soil management, that can reduce up to one-third of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we need to stay be beyond um, two degrees increase Celsius by, by 2030. So, where does the Red Cross come into this? Um, and a few examples of our work. Um, as mentioned before, one of our examples is from Vietnam, um, not dissimilar to the example Reynold was providing early on, looking at the potential of mangrove restoration. Um, so this is some work that began already decades ago. This is one of our first environmental projects back in, it started back in the 90s. Um, and it was from an understanding that coastal areas in northeastern Vietnam had been degraded by war, by urbanization, um, by shifting towards aquaculture and destroying the mangrove base. And that made the local communities more vulnerable to um, coastal erosion, to storms, to typhoons and extreme events. Um, and it was through that that the Red Cross started thinking, okay, actually mangrove restoration is going to reduce disaster risk. And we, as a humanitarian organization, are focused on, on dealing with disasters and crises and alleviating human suffering. And so working with uh, nature can help us achieve our objectives. Um, and it started with five communities. Over time, it spread to over 100 communities from one to eight provinces. And it's really become a protective belt of a coastal area in northeastern Vietnam. 
Um, so the communities, it's critical that they're in the driving seat. Again, a point that Reynold was, was um, providing as well, um, that they design what is the approach they need, that their engagement is ensured. Um, we had active involvement of um, youth and school children in this project, and that's still ongoing. Um, close collaboration with local government, with national government, uh, also with environmental authorities so that they can provide technical guidance on what types of mangrove uh, varieties to use and where, for example. And now actually this project has largely been taken over by government um, with, with only the community involvement, no longer with Red Cross involvement, which of course from a sustainability perspective is, is an ideal situation. Here's a very different landscape, as you can see. These are from uh, Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. That's one of the largest refugee camps in the world. Um, it's again been there for, for well over a decade. Um, especially at a large drought at the time, uh, caused huge amounts of, of migration and displacement in the region within and outside Kenya, and people arrived to Dadaab refugee camp, which itself was in a drought prone area. Um, and so these green belts were, were installed as a means to protect that area and that refugee camp itself from further, um, they provided wind breaks from sandstorms, they helped uh, capture the soil so that it was possible to do agriculture there. Um, and then indeed this was an example also that, that some of these nature-based solutions take time. We don't always have time. Communities have immediate needs and those needed to be responded to. So this was combined with a local agriculture project which was, had shorter term benefits and immediate um, food security and economic benefits for, for the, both the host community in the area and, and the refugees living in the camp. Um, and then a final example, this is from um, it's going through the continents uh, over in, in Central America, in Honduras. Um, so this originally began as a disaster risk reduction and, and response project following um, tropical storms and their impacts in communities in, in the Olancho area. Um, and, and rebuilding from that, um, there was a high risk of landslides um, and also an, extreme, uh, an increased occurrence of extreme events due to climate change. Um, and one of the factors was that these landslides were basically um, destroying um, agricultural crops, they were destroying local infrastructure, both homes and public infrastructure like schools, hospitals, etc. Um, so this solution looks at different types of vegetation you can use, and this is called fascines. So you can see they're kind of built on the slope like that, and they basically capture both water and soil during landslides, basically preventing and reducing the impact of that uh, landslide on the communities. Um, and so that was also something that was done with the local communities and, and the local government um, disaster management units. Um, and these are also practices which have then been adopted by the communities. This started about five years ago and these are still ongoing uh, once the project ended. So that um, takes me to the end of my slides. Um, there's just a little bit uh, more information there on our website on further examples on our work. Um, and you're very welcome to, to visit there and do let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. So, you, you can please Thank you so much, uh, Nina, for this presentation. And I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you, of course. Um, what would you say uh, are the challenges of working with nature, including for a humanitarian organization mm. such as yours? Yeah, I think, I think one was the point I slightly alluded to is, is that some of these solutions take time. Mm. Um, and so having that, that time aspect, especially for humanitarian organizations, problematic. We're more used to responding in the short term. Uh, another one is actually this issue of scale. So we're very used to working at like in one community. Um, and like I was showing these examples, we need to go bigger, so mm -hmm. from one community to the watershed or the coastal area, um, and some of the problems and solutions might not be coming from that community, mm -hmm. so we need to deal with them at a broader scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then also this issue of expertise, as a humanitarian organizations in general, we are not environmental experts, mm -hmm. so we really need to partner, whether it's with governments or, or with, with local or national organizations and, and research institutes to bring some of those solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is really a bit of a shift in how we do humanitarian work so that we start working not just after, but before, during and after disasters. Mm -hmm. and we start building overall resilience of communities mm -hmm. um, and at, across time and across scale. 
scales, basically. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you for that answer. And uh, how would you say that nature-based solutions compare with other solutions mm. to address disaster risk and climate change? Right. Um, I think that the benefits of nature-based solutions are that, that they often build on resources that communities have access to. So we're dealing with soil or, or water or, or trees that, that are there, basically. Um, they, you know, they, they often build skills that local communities have, as opposed to, for example, engineering solutions. Mm. Um, but in some cases, it's, it's also a combination. So a nature-based solution might not provide the degree of coastal protection we need. So you can also be looking at combining engineering solutions of say a seawall with a nature-based solution, depending on the area. And, and I think that's, that's really important to, to have multiple solutions. And for example, with climate change, we still very much need technology, early warning systems, um, financing systems. It's that combination of yeah. solutions. It's part of that broader package mm. um, of resilience to, to climate change, to disasters mm. that we need. Thank yeah. you for this explanation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will move on now to the circular second-hand activities within the Red Cross of Sweden. So the Red Cross in Sweden has about 250 second-hand shops all over the country. And uh, the surplus goes to helping families uh, to a better life by helping them, helping them with food, water and uh, health care, for example. But running all these shops means a lot of work, I uh, <laughs> presume. And uh, a vital part is a great system of logistics, which uh, it all depends on, actually. So therefore, we welcome you, Ms. Rudbeck, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nini, also. It was really interesting to meet you. It's, we are a large organization, and it's always nice to get an update. Uh, so now we're going to focus on Sweden. I'm from the Swedish Red Cross. How many of you here have donated clothes to a charity shop? <laughs> More than half. I would say 80% maybe. How many of you have shopped at a charity shop? Almost as many. Wow, I'm impressed. I'm very happy. Uh, this is why I'm here. This is my favorite subject. Um, uh, if for those of you who were here after lunch, we heard the beautiful Bach music uh, cello plate. He didn't want to fly. So the fashion industry is a larger polluter than uh, aircraft and transport uh, industries together. Did you know that? Yeah, someone is nodding their heads. This is crazy. And Swedish Red Cross, of course, we want to be a part of the solution, not of the problem. Um, since the 80s, uh, Swedish Red Cross has had uh, thrift shops, second-hand shops to finance our activities around in Sweden. Um, in these, as you mentioned, 250 different places, has anyone here visited a Red Cross second-hand shop also? Oh, yes, I'm with you. You're with me, at least. <laughs> um, so in these shops, we collect. We sort, we price, and we sell uh, collected uh, textiles. And now I'm focusing on textiles. And this is because textiles is the largest volume that we reach. We also sell other things, of course. Uh, these um, 250 shops are mainly run by volunteers. And they do a fantastic job about this. Uh, so if we receive about 100, um, I'm going to move on to the next picture. If we focus on the part to the right now, um, if we have 100 t-shirts, we receive 100 t-shirts to our stores, we can sell about 40 of them. 40. Is that a lot? Is that a little? What do you think? A little. Yes, actually it's a lot. Our competitors sell less. <laughs> Are you surprised? I know. You, If you... You think that you recycle glass by putting the glass in the glass bin, right? You recycle clothes by giving it to charity. But we cannot sell everything. It can be uh, wrong season, it can be wrong fashion, it can be torn out, many things. But we, we know that for a fact that we sell more than our competitors because we have a very low cost and the prices are not as high also. But nonetheless, we only sell about 40% and uh, we want to take care because 
these goods were donated to us, we have to take care about everything. So uh, since about seven, eight years, we ship the surplus, the 60% to Germany. Why not Sweden? Well, in Sweden, uh, there has not been uh, receivers of these qualities. In Sweden, we only recycle about 20%, 27% of uh, our textiles, but in Germany, they are much better than we are. They recycle 80% of their textiles. So, and they, it, it's a much uh, larger market, shorter, uh, you, you know, Sweden is so long. This is, as we spoke about, it's about a lot about uh, logistics and transportation also. Uh, so Germany is one of our primarily buyers. Um, what do they do with it? They, um, first, some of them have, has, uh, uh, second-hand shops, and then uh, for those parts that are sellable, I will say. First, they sort what is sellable, what is not sellable. Uh, what cannot be sold in their second-hand shops, they um, shift, uh, sell also to uh, other parts of the world. But not everything is sellable, as I told you. Um, and what happens to that? Does anyone know? Do you have a suggestion? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, you know, if you make something more valuable, you call it upcycled. Here we're talking about downcycling because it's very expensive to upcycle, at least today. Uh, so they can either cut it to cleaning rags or they can t tear it to isolation material, for instance, in cars. There's a lot of uh, isolation material from textiles in cars in, into inside. Um, out of these 60 t-shirts I told you they sent, uh, 36 of them get sold as clothes. That remains 24% is getting uh, cut down to cleaning rags, to isolation material, and only six of the t-shirts gets incinerated. Uh, this is a pretty good solution, but of course we want to move forward and happily we are in Sweden. In Sweden we have some of the biggest retailers in fashion, also in uh, furniture, if you know what company I'm speaking about. <laughs> and they put a lot of money into research and development. Everyone selling uh, textiles today collect textiles, not by law, because many of you might know that in 2025, there will be a producer law uh, about textiles, and we're only uh, we're not there yet. But everyone selling is receiving, uh, so they're putting a lot of money <coughs> into research. And um, uh, today, there are two very exciting uh, projects in Sweden. First, in uh, the municipalities in Malmo, uh, ha have started uh, about <coughs> a year ago an infrared laser scanner, the largest automated uh, sorting machine in the world. Why do you need an infrared laser? Yes, because it's very hard to know the fiber content of the uh, textiles, if the label <coughs> is not there. Um, so they uh, read all the, um, this information and sort it. So when you have it sorted, other companies can buy that the different sorts. For instance, uh, if you have more than 95% cotton in an item, um, a textile uh, item, uh, there's a Swedish company in uh, Sundsvall called Renewcell that uh, can make a new fiber out of that. It's called Circulose. Has anyone heard about that? No? Yeah, some is nodding. It's, it's very, very interesting. They took in 50 million Swedish crowns in the uh, investments uh, some years ago and um, uh, it's very fascinating that this is here in Sweden so of course we want to be a part of that and the logistic part of that is really really difficult but because as you can see um, on the right side we're a very long country uh, Malmö is down here in the south and uh, Sundsvall is up there so how do you do this it's not easy to the left side this is what I uh, we want to do, we want to go from linear to circular. Instead of just have this flown uh, and be happy about it, we want to 
be able to not have to send to Germany. Maybe some of the clothes that still are working as clothes, <coughs> we are not able to send. Maybe we still ship it there. But the surplus, the rest, we don't want to ship it to Germany to get the same treatment as here. Uh, so that is our goal, to, to close the loop. And of course, we're doing that together with the SDG 12. And we're also using the... Uh, sorry, the EU uh, waste hierarchy from 2008. Uh, let me see your time. Uh, a couple of minutes, one minute. One minute, thank you. I can speak forever <laughs> about this. Um, <coughs> yes, so um, before closing the loop, uh, the logistic challenges of you, I've, you are with me now, that we, we have to sort, we have to transport. So what we want to do as much as possible, we want to be able to find a new home for the clothes locally. So uh, we at the Red Cross, we are in 250 places in Sweden. And I hope all of you that are in Sweden that you find, I there, I was so happy to see so many of you already a customer. But uh, please continue to do that so we can together um, make this better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva Maria. Please have a seat and I have a couple of questions to you as well. Um, First, I, I would like to ask you if you have seen uh, a change in mindset of people when it comes to the target groups uh, related to, to circular, circular thinking and sustainability. Yes, we have. Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, the recycled I uh, clothing item was the uh, Christmas uh, present of the year. Mm. Do you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> yeah, some of you. Um, we have we have definitely seen the Greta effect, I call it. Um, but we also have seen that uh, we have a lot of new competitors. Uh, digitalization, we have Facebook Market, we have Tradera here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so now it's easier for people instead of, because sometimes you want to uh, get rid of these clothes. We, s we know that still a lot of people throw them in the garbage, which is, um, I think it's because it's very easy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we can see that we have to be on our toes in so that people want to donate to us so we can use the money mm -hmm. to do good instead of uh, throwing in the garbage or selling themselves mm -hmm. because it's so much easier now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really positive. Uh, it is. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, when it comes to your second-hand shops and, and this, uh, what, if you look like five, ten years ahead in time um, and think of reuse and recycling, what do you think will happen? How will it evolve? I hope <laughs> our goal uh, is that we will be, when you think about second-hand clothes, you automatically think about donating and buying at Red Cross, that we are a, a, a partner, someone that you can rely on. Uh, but also I think that um, we will have the logistical setups uh, because it's very complicated. We're discussing both with Ziptex and Renewcell, how can we do this logistically um, cost efficient? Um, Renewcell told us, well, you are very, very small, but we still want to talk to you and we want to talk to them. Mm. Um, how do we find the big volumes in this? It's, um, it's going to take some time, but it's not going to go reverse. I'm sure about that. The, the pressure is so hard on this. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other companies also enabling us to go more circular. Mm. That's great. Hope for the future. Yes. <laughs> so, um, a big applause again to our panelists, <laughs> Eva, Maria, and Nini. And I have a little symbolic. Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> Thank, oh, you're you. Welcome. Thank you. So <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. One to you as well. Thank you. Oh. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I have now the honor to welcome Mr. Anders Wikman, who is the honorary president for the Club of Rome. And he is also a chair of the European Project Climate, KIC. 
Mr. Wikman has been a member of the European Parliament, has been a Swedish MP, and he has also been uh, the Secretary General of the Swedish Red Cross. To that we can also add uh, President of the International Red Cross uh, Disaster Relief Commission. Mr. Wikman is also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and he will talk about how overconsumption affects our planet. So a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. So we have to load the yes, I'm slides. Yes, pop up quite soon. Yeah, there we are. The, the light is very strong. Do I have to cope with that? It's for the TV. Okay. Um, well, very nice to be here. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we have chosen a topic that is not so very often discussed, partly because in political circles to touch upon consumption and consumer behavior is thought to be a bit delicate. Politicians don't really want to infringe on freedom of choice, etc. So I'll uh, try to give you my perception of the situation and of the role that consumption plays, in particular with regard to the ecological and climate crisis or challenges. And since I'm uh, representing the Club of Rome. Um, it's quite natural for me to uh, start with this uh, slide. It's the picture of the Limits to Growth, which was uh, launched exactly 50 years ago. So when we commemorate the Stockholm Conference, we also somehow commemorate this report. Um, and it was a report that basically said, we cannot continue to increase material consumption endlessly after on a, on a finite planet. The only resource that is all, all the time coming is solar energy, but the rest is sort of fixed. Um, and the report was a little bit like a bombshell because for many, many years after the Second World War, the um, countries in different parts of the world had been growing quite fast, uh, reconstruction, improving living standards, etc. And here comes an organization basically saying the track you're on is not sustainable. Uh, and the report, on the one hand, was printed in tens of millions of copies, uh, on the other hand, and spread widely and discussed widely. I remember because I, I, was, I was around. Um, but at the same time, it was ridiculed by quite a lot of policymakers. I remember that Ronald Reagan, he said, there is no limit to human ingenuity and imagination. That was his response. The later uh, receiver of the uh, economics prize, the so-called Nobel Prize in economics, Nordhaus, three years ago, can you imagine? He said that this was bullshit, uh, resources would be plenty of, and if there was scarcity in one type of resource, we could always substitute. And of course, in a way, he's right. There is a lot of resources, and you can substitute. I mean, I could have a plastic table instead of this one. But what you cannot substitute is for the functioning of the ecosystems and the stable climate. So, uh, conventional economists then and still today seem to have difficulties to really understand the relationship between planet Earth and our economy. And the need we have for high quality energy and a lot of natural resources. And the tragedy is that this wake-up call was not really listened to. We have continued on the same path focusing on production growth all the time. 
And of course, if you are a very, very poor country, any type of production is probably good. But uh, if you are achieving a higher standard of living, we know that some kinds of production growth are positive, but some kinds are and can be very negative. And the way we measure progress is primarily through production, um, the sum of production. And it's a quantitative measure. It entails no qualitative dimension whatsoever. So the result can be good, but it can also be a disaster. The income distribution can be fair, but it can also be the opposite. And we can pollute a lot, and it's still counted as positives, or we can pollute less. Um, and I would submit that the economic system that guides us is failing on three major issues. First of all, the way we see it today, and increasingly so, social tension is building. So this type of growth society is really destab destabilizing societies. Uh, and secondly, it's destabilizing the planet, because whatever we look at, carbon emissions, other types of greenhouse gas emissions, ecological degradation, overutilization of natural resources, the indicators are constantly negative. I was around in 1992 in, in Rio for the Rio conference. Since that time, we have emitted as much greenhouse gases as we did before. And yet, at that point in time, we agreed, the world, community, to work together to fight dangerous climate change. So there is something wrong in the system. And thirdly, we seem not to value the future because the system is so short-term in nature. The Americans have an expression, instant gratification. We don't want to delay gratification. We want things now. Companies are judged, at least, at least listed companies, they are just, they are, they are judged based on their quarterly results. Every third month, they, they have to present the result. It builds into the system short-termism. And with short-termism, we cannot address these long-term challenges. Here you can see a picture from the Global Footprint Network that we are increasingly overutilizing or overusing the planet's resources. And here is another graph which shows the um, global GDP is the green curve. The blue is global greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that they have followed each other, but a little bit less because we have become a bit more energy efficient over the years. But material, materials, which is uh, the, the red, you can see that materials, material use grows even faster. And here you have this, this is a graph of the Human Development Index, where on the one hand, you're supposed to uh, do good, do well on social indicators, and at the same time, on ecological indicators. Um, and the fact is that quite a number of countries like Sweden, we are doing well on the social indicators, but we are doing very bad uh, on the ecological indicators. We overconsume, at least based on today's technologies and lifestyles. Here you see the uh, increase of greenhouse gas emissions since uh, 1960. And this I brought with me just to illustrate the other side, namely the ecological destruction. This is an interesting picture or slide. This is the aggregate body weight of vertebrates on land. Alltså den samlade kroppsvikten av ryggradsdjur på land. The dark grey, that's us, humans. The light grey, that's our husbandry. Det är kusser och får och jätter och alltihopa. And the green dots towards the margin, you know what that is? Wild animals. 3%. If we had done this 100 years ago, it would look quite different, I can tell you. And I'm reminded of um, David Attenborough, 
who was interviewed some time ago, and he was talking about his long life as a traveler in the world, observing nature. And he said, I started, I believe, he said, in 1938. And I can't, I can't speak like him, but he somehow said, and at that time, 70% of the land area was wilderness. Today, I'm afraid, only 30% of wilderness. And that illustrates what's going on. Now, natural resources are sort of the core of consumption, or production as well. And we have four major categories. Biomass, everything from wood from forests to crops. We have fossil fuels, we have metals, and we have uh, minerals. And uh, here you can see how <coughs> in demand has increased since 1970. We have had a three, three doubling of demand. And the dotted line there is economic growth. And as you can see, we talked a lot some um, 35 years ago. I remember that day when Brundtland came to Stockholm and in, in hotel, the Grand Hotel in Salzgebaden presented the Brundtland report. And one of the messages was decoupling. We should cut the link between economic growth and resource use. And that happened to some extent, as you can see, in the 1990s. But that was, I think, mainly due to the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed. And most of that production capacity also collapsed. But now, demand for materials is growing even faster than, 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 than the growth of the economy. And I'm a member of this illustrious body. It's a UN body, International Resource Panel. It's a group of 35 experts around the world. We follow very closely resource use and resource demand and, and try to understand, will there be enough? And how will there be enough? And we have come to the conclusion that it's not only energy that matters when, with regard to climate. Around 50% of carbon emissions are directly or indirectly linked to the use of materials. Extraction and production of materials. Steel, cement, ammonia, aluminium, plastics, textiles, etc. Uh, and uh, 80 to 90 percent of biodiversity loss, and that's mainly modern agriculture. Here you can see how the ratio of uh, these basic materials and their use in society has increased over the years. In 1995, they made up 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, those iron, steel, aluminium, cement, etc. And now, recently, they made up 23%. And to make it more complicated in the years to come, we have calculated that because of population growth and, and, and migration to the cities, there is a need to build as much urban infrastructure from now on till 2050, as we have built hitherto in, in the world. And you know, if that happens with today's materials and today's technologies, we are toast, because only that will exhaust the so-called carbon budget that we have to secure not 1.5, but 2 degrees. And here you see how uneven the distribution is. Material footprints here in Sweden we use roughly 25, 27 tons of materials per year, aggregately. <laughs> if you live in Africa, south of Sahara, your footprint is two. It's a colossal difference, isn't it? Here you have this put in another way. 10% of the world population, basically us in the Western countries, plus middle income takers in some developing countries, we make up 50% of carbon emissions. And here is a graph from uh, the US which shows that income really matters for consumption. If you earn $50,000 a year in the US, you have roughly 40 tons of CO2 per capita. And the more you earn, if I walk here, the more you earn, the further you come here. And, and please recall, we are supposed to get below one ton in the near future. 
But this really shows how difficult it is and how dependent we are on high quality energy. And the more money you have, the more, the more stuff you use. Whether you have two houses or dwellings <laughs> or three, whether you take a weekend trip from New York to London once every second month, whether you have big boats, etc., 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 it's 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 there is there is a there is a mechanism here that is very interesting. Uh, and just to reflect on electricity use in the U.S., the the black one there. 459 kilowatt hours for per, for a year. That's the consumption of uh, a refrigerator in the U.S. And these other figures are the amount of kilowatt hours that an ordinary citizen in Nigeria or Kenya uses during the whole year, not for a refrigerator, but for everything. So against this background, consumption is very complex. On the one hand. We talk about consumption to meet basic needs. But then the question comes, what is basic needs? I had a dear friend for many years, Manfred Max Neff, an alternative economist in Chile. He wrote a book where he distinguished between needs and satisfiers of needs. And the satisfiers was all the fluff fluff that we really, didn't, really don't need. Another aspect is, of course, access to consumer credits. In this country, we have, the banks have opened their purse enormously for apartments and for dwellings, but also for consumption. It's very easy to borrow money. You need absolutely no security. And there are a lot of institutions outside the formal bank system. And where does that money go? Consumption. Uh, Another important aspect is, of course, the role played by the advertising. I, I remember when I was a kid in the late 1940s, early 1950s, there was hardly any advertising. There was information. But advertising had sort of a breakthrough in the 1950s, in particular in America. And I think it was very much a combination of newspapers uh, needing the money, but also television. Uh, and advertising, in many instances, creates this, this feeling that I need this. And then you have a, a particular type of consumption. It's called positioning consumption. It's to impress on people. Uh, the, the bigger my car, the better I am. Or the more fancy my clothes, the better I am. All that. And then, as I said earlier, the more you earn, the more you buy. And policymakers are a bit afraid. I, I was chairing the task force in Sweden leading to our climate strategy and the climate law. It was a group of policymakers, and I was sort of an independent chairman. And the only issue we couldn't touch upon was consumption. And I remember I went to um, Minister... Um, Matilda, no, what's her name? Uh, Minister of Development Cooperation now. Um, yeah, Anne Kranz. She was representing the Social Democrats. I have said this before openly, so I, I can repeat it. I went to her and I said, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of discussing and trying to come up with something on consumption. And I know the Greens want that, and the left party want to do that. So together with me, we have a majority in the commission. And then she looked at me and she said, I c I'm not allowed to do, do that unless the center-right parties agree. And that's how touchy the issue is. I don't blame her personally, I sort of blame the party. Uh, here you see how a report from the Hot and Cool Institute has divided the um, carbon footprints in relation to consumption. Food, housing, transport, consumer goods, leisure and services. And as you can see, food, housing and transport in most countries dominate. Uh, but uh, you have a distinct difference, of course, between 
countries like Canada and Finland at the top, where the average punt pin is 14 or 10 or whatever, and uh, developing or low-income countries. So when you are addressing this overconsumption versus underconsumption, you have to focus attention on these particular categories. So given this very complex background, what, what the hell should we do? There are, in my view, measures to be considered both at the more systemic level and at the individual level. And we have to not only decarbonize societies, we have also to dematerialize as much as possible. Because, at least in Europe, and it's not very much different in other parts of the world, we basically use materials only once. A lot of materials could be used and used again and used again and used again. Some would lose quality, like plastics and paper, etc. But metals and minerals you can use repeatedly without any problem. It's not 100%, but we could, could reach a long way. So that's why we are talking more and more about moving from linear to circular material flows. And policies to enhance that would be, first of all, a tax shift. Reduce taxes on labor and income and put a tax on the use of nature. Because basically you pay nothing to use nature today. You don't pay for the externalities. Only in a few instances. And I fail to understand that, how that can be. And you know what the problem then is? That the secondary materials market doesn't function because it's most often cheaper to source virgin materials than to use secondary materials. And if something is cheaper, few companies would buy the, the, the more expensive one on and on again. I think we should also remove VAT on reused materials. We have to design products and materials much better so that they can be reused and recycled. We have to promote what I call going from products to services. I take my telephone. If I buy this, Apple doesn't bother about me once they've sold it. And they start trying to convince that I buy a new one as soon as possible. If I would lease this instead, it's another business model. They would then make it more, more robust. It would last longer, it could be updated, etc., etc. And they would be interested in designing it so once it's over, its life is over, they can take it back and use materials again. So this is a very interesting concept from products to services. Public procurement, of course, must lead the way. Uh, we have to have material efficiency as priority in uh, policy making. And we have to address the rebound effect, but I don't have time to, to talk about that now. Now, secondly, and I, I'm, I'm finishing soon, and this is very interesting. We have to analyze people's needs and figure out how can we provide for them in a more intelligent way, in a more efficient, efficient way. And I, I've taken mobility in cities as an example. If you ask the average man in the street, what are we going to do now with mobility, given all, all, all kinds of pollution and carbon dioxide? They will tell you, oh yeah, we just uh, replace the combustion engine with an electric vehicle, then we have done it. No, I say, because electric vehicles, they consume a lot of resources, they need batteries, etc. We have to come up with something much smarter. Uh, a mobility system that builds on mobility as a service, where you design cities so it's easier to walk, to bike, you expand public transport, etc., etc. Then you would probably reduce the number of vehicles needed in the city from maybe 100 to 40 or even 30. So that's just an example that you can provide for services in a totally needs in a totally different way. Food, the same. We have to get away, get rid of all the food waste. Circularity, I've already talked about. Reducing living space. Skanska, before the pandemic, did a study in the Stockholm area, all the big office spaces that they were managing. And on average, every uh, desk was occupied 15% of the time. 
The rest of the time, people were out running. So you don't need all this space. And you don't, all need, you don't need all the space even in your own dwelling. So there you could also s save a lot of resources. Uh, and then finally, coupled to this, we have to start the discussion of what is quality of life. It's not only material consumption. It's about stuff, but it's about so many other things. And if you walk out here and ask people, they would not, they would not tell you that the only thing that matters is more stuff. They would say a good, a nice job, a clean environment. They would talk about culture, education, friends, etc. So here are examples of inefficient systems. And then, of course, you have to encourage business to become more responsible. This guy, for him, profits to shareholders was the only thing. This guy, who was head of Unilever, he widened the topic and said, the purpose of business is also to contribute positively to society. And if you contribute positively to society, you don't build a lot of obsolescence into products just to sell more, etc., etc. So it's about ethics in business also. Um, and then finally, start to address what we call overconsumption. And there you could play with everything from personal carbon credits to uh, progressively tax excess pollution. Uh, my friend Louis Akenyi has introduced the concept of choice editing, where you basically prohibit certain types of consumption. I don't think we are there yet, but you can just talk about Abramovich big yachts, for instance, or private jets all over the place. Um, rationing is another example. I don't think we are ready for that, but we may be ready for that, and I think we have to be prepared for that. And then, in the long term, we need to discuss a goal, which is sufficiency for all. Not a lot for some and too little for the rest. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Anders. We could indeed listen to you uh, a long, long time. And uh, I must say that I really appreciate this especially the, the comparisons that you have, because it's very pedagogical and you can put things in perspective. So a very big thank you for, for joining us here today. And the best of luck with your future work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have a little gift. Thank you. That I would like to give you. Thanks. There you go. Extra, oh, salt or corn. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, we are now moving on to our last panel, and we have invited uh, Mr. Pelle Enarsson, who is Senior Advisor of the United Nations Foundation. And we will also bring up to the stage representatives from three United Nations associations, namely Ms. Jenny Kaupula, who is Advocacy Work Officer from UNA Finland. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Inessa Pambukchan, who is Project Coordinator from UNA Armenia, and Ms. Tiona Lebanitz, who is Program Director of UNA Georgia. Please welcome all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Thank and you. welcome. So, uh, let's see. We will actually um, uh, do like this then. Uh, we are going to, to discuss the future of the United Nations and the need for a stronger and bolder global climate and environmental action uh, when it comes to a healthy planet and also prosperity of all and how United Nations Association can be part of that. Uh, but Mr. Pelle Enarsson, I will start with you here. Um, the UN Foundation has held consultations on our common agenda. Uh, and the report which represents then the Secretary General Antonio Guterres' um, latest report and his vision on the future of global cooperation and effective multilateralism. So could you please give us a brief introduction to our common agenda and also share your thoughts uh, of the need for stronger climate and environmental action? Uh, if you want to stand here, that's perfectly right. If you want to sit there, it's perfectly right. It's up to you. I'll, I'll sit here if You'll you sit there, hear me well and we can of course. Ha also have a conversation about this. Uh, thank you, Anneli. And, um, 
I was part of the team that helped uh, prepare this uh, report that came out last September, uh, our common agenda. And if I would ask the audience here, have you read the report? Have you even heard about it? I'm not so sure. I, okay, there are a couple of hands. That's good. Uh, and it's a bit strange because this report is actually a quite radical uh, platform for change of multilateral cooperation. And it came about uh, as a response to, I think the Secretary General himself ex described it as the X-ray of humanity that the pandemic had, had given, the X-ray of the issues that are, uh, that are confronting us. And his report was a response, of course, to a call from member states uh, to uh, have the UN work better to deal with a crisis like the pandemic, but also other uh, crises. Of course, the climate, uh, climate issue is strongly in the agenda, but there is also a growing sense of uh, continued economic inequalities, uh, increased violence and conflict, and uh, issues like food and hunger are also growing issues. So this is a combination of all the challenges that are. It's, that's why it's called our common agenda. It's generic and it deals basically with, with everything from uh, climate change to hunger to inequalities to um, uh, disarmament. I would like to, I mean, when the Secretary General presented the report, he said, we are either going to have a breakthrough or a breakdown. That's how uh, strongly he put it when he presented the report. So we are faced with a breakdown or we could actually work together in a more effective way to get a breakthrough. And he, I would, you can read the report and you can make your own judgments, but I would uh, summarize it in, 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 in three ways, uh, th th this, this report. It, it has a very strong focus on, on the national level, on building a new social contract, uh, of course based a lot on the implementation of the SDGs and the accelerated uh, implementation of the SDGs. It also has a global dimension about solidarity at the global level and the Secretary General points to all the global commons that needs to be dealt with in a, in a more effic efficient way, including new issues like our web and the, uh, the artificial intelligence and, and the new challenges that we, are, that we are confronting. And the third dimension of sol solidarity was the intergenerational one. So a much stronger focus on working with young people that are the leaders of the next generation and also to deal with the next generation. The more than, yeah, it's 10.9, according to one scenario of the UN, 10.9 billion people that are going to be born in this remaining century. So more people are going to be born than actually uh, live on the planet today. We need to start thinking about how to deal uh, with those 10.9 billion. And that's the, uh, one of the reference scenarios. There is a, there is a sort of a, the most positive scenario. If there's a full implementation of the SDGs in time, it's around uh, the same amount of people as live now, about 7 billion. And the worst case scenario, if we don't do hardly anything about this, more than 15 billion people will be born in the next century. So there, those are the scenarios, the big uh, meta scenarios that we talk about. So, uh, the uh, so the final point I want to make about the report is that the Secretary General also uh, emphasizes a new way of working, uh, more networked and more inclusive multilateralism, not only member states negotiating, but involving people like you, the associations that are in the field, the business and companies, the young people and the activists. And of course this, we have heard it before, I, I, we heard Anders talk about uh, the Rio conference which was a good example of where a lot of engagement with civil society etc. But, but here he wants even a bolder vision about working together with business and, and cities and, and other entities to bring this agenda forward. So I think that's um, where I would like to stop on the on the on this on the summary of um, 
of the report. And as you can hear, you asked me about climate and, and environment. And that's why we are gathering here because of the Stockholm Conference and the heritage of Stockholm in 1972. And my own take of the analysis that the Secretary General is doing is that we cannot deal with each issue piecemeal. We need to have a much bigger, uh, bigger uh, frame to deal with these issues. We cannot deal with climate change only in the climate, frame, uh, climate negotiation framework. It needs to be de dealt there. It needs to be pushed hard. But we also need to deal with climate in all other aspects uh, of, of the work. We also cannot deal with climate change if we don't deal with the economic inequalities, for instance. So it's, it's a much more comprehensive, much more difficult and, and broad agenda, but uh, if we go piecemeal, it won't work. Mm. Thank you so much, Pelle, for this introduction to our common agenda. And uh, the thing is that in a little while, we will actually hand over a statement to the Swedish State Secretary of International Development Cooperation. And uh, this statement has been uh, brought to, to life, so to speak, by the World uh, Federation of United Nations Association. And uh, I will uh, tell you a little bit more about it, but it's also linked to our common agenda in various ways. So I will now turn to uh, my uh, colleagues here to the right. Um, what would you say, and I'll start with you, Jenny, if that's okay. Uh, what do you see as the most important messages in the statement? And uh, how would you say that it links to the uh, report, Our Common Agenda? Well, I think um, the Our Common Agenda's um, big um, invention is the strategic foresight. Um, it really looks into the future. Um, it makes sure that we are keeping the planet livable for the future generations. We are repurposing um, the UN and uh, we are taking the citizens and um, the s cities and um, companies, everybody along to do this uh, because we can't really get the picture of the future without uh, hearing everybody. So I think here uh, we as UNAs play a great role um, as bridging between the people and the UN. And um, yeah, the OCA is, is a good tool um, to both um, like reimagining uh, the way uh, the UN works and also to um, make sure that um, climate change and um, other environmental um, challenges are tackled um, holistically, as Bella was just uh, explaining very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, what about well, Tiona? Would you like to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, and thank you for having us here. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, it has been really absolutely fantastic and inspiring to listen to all the stories and all the work that is done in Sweden and around the world. And I think we will all take a lot of inspiration and lots of ideas from this uh, event. Uh, I would say that it's not uh, a very easy task to choose <laughs> uh, the most important messages, but uh, as, a civil so as a representative of civil society organization, and I will look in my notes now, uh, if I had to choose, I would choose uh, as most important, uh, or I will emphasize the, the importance of raising awareness uh, of how human activities damage environment, environment. Uh, you know, edu educating public on more sustainable lifestyle and also empowering youth for climate action because I do believe that uh, individual uh, responsibility mm -hmm. against the fight of uh, <laughs> against the fight of uh, for climate change is very important. And uh, just to take myself also away from the notes and uh, from the organization maybe and on the individual level. I, I, I honestly believe that if uh, we want to give ourselves uh, a modicum of hope for the, uh, that we can leave the healthy planet for the mm -hmm. future generations, we all need to act together. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, as individuals, communities, civil society, governments, leaders, businesses, we all need to realize that we have the responsibility and that we are accountable. And uh, I, the 
we, we need to act now, as the statement says, that it's, it's very urgent, we need to act now. And uh, I might be very sentimental in saying this, but uh, I really believe that we need to save planet or rather save ourselves, because in my very non-scientific opinion, the planet and the Earth can actually go on without us, but we, without us humans, but we humans, we we cannot survive without our mm. planet. So no, that's, that's well why said. it's important. Well said. And um, when it comes to the United Nations uh, associations that we have represented here, could you uh, tell us a little about of how you contribute to the global work to, to tackle the three planetary crises that we have spoken about a bit here today, uh, the climate, biodiversity and also pollution? Would anyone, uh, Inessa, for example, would you like to? Yes. Mm, thank you, uh, first of all, again, for this opportunity to present what we are doing within our organization. And thank you for the question. Uh, so indeed, yes, the planetary um, three crises, the climate change, the uh, loss of biodiversity and the pollution are reinforcing each other and uh, driving uh, further damage to our environment. So, uh, sure, uh, first of all, in, first of all, industrial countries and uh, governments should take immediate actions to combat this climate crisis. Uh, but mm, because we don't have time, as it was mentioned, and we don't have another 50 years. But as uh, we heard a lot uh, yesterday, the global youth voices, and as we follow the Wafuna statement on, uh, as it includes not only the governments, not only the business sector, but also the civil society, so it's call on action, also us. So uh, we, we as a civil society organizations, as the ones who are working with youngsters also, uh, need to take immediate actions as well. Uh, what we are doing within our organization, within Armenia United Nations uh, Association, it's puti putting the emphasis on the educational part. So we are creating a non-formal educational platform uh, within which we are building the capacity of the rural remote communities, youngsters of rural remote communities of Armenia. And after uh, gaining knowledge, our building their uh, capacities in the theoretical platform, they are passing into practical part. So organizing some initiatives, actions, so they are uh, guiding actions toward environment, towards environmental sustainability. And while implementing some activities on their local communities, such as uh, tree planting activities or cleaning days, they are uh, cooperating with the local governments and including them and other residents of the community in the process. So making this process inclusive, they are uh, somehow teaching uh, the community members, the duty bearers, that everyone should take a ex an action and everyone is the part of the process uh, for the development. Yes, and um, by this, we can say small uh, actions, uh, we believe that this is where the change comes and this is uh, these youngsters are about to bring change. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is uh, some example from where we can start on ourselves, on our behalf, to uh, fight this uh, three planetary crisis mm. in the world. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, anyone else who would like to, to answer shortly this question? Or um, I could uh, just raise the point that um, we have been doing um, um, online courses to educate the public uh, about the interlinkages, um, especially based on the Global Sustainable Development Report of 2019, which raised the point of the triple planetary crisis with um, growing inequalities, both within countries and between countries, being the four uh, reasons why we can't achieve um, any of the SDGs um, if we don't tackle these. Mm -hmm. So um, we have then uh, built the structure of the courses on the basis of the transformational areas that we need to tackle. Um, most of them have been uh, discussed here throughout the two days. And um, the courses are targeted to uh, general audience, uh, and then specifically to um, local and regional authorities, mm -hmm. and then one for teachers. Um, and the teachers have been then trained um, to be like the champions of uh, sustainable development um, uh, project and, and, and um, curricul curricular um, um, like implementation in, in the schools. Um, yeah, so I would mention those. 
Thank you. Fiona, would you like? Yes, uh, I, I would like to share very shortly how uh, an organization that is not an environmental organization or we don't have uh, especially in special environmental programs or projects, we still mainstream environment. And as a civil society, we think that it's uh, our responsibility to contribute, contribute to uh, the issue. Uh, so as Inessa mentioned, we work a lot on youth empowerment and uh, we try to equip the youth all across Georgia, that's the country where I come from and where we work, uh, all across the Georgia to, uh, you know, with the skills and with the knowledge and with the capacity, so then they can mobilize around the issues that are important to them. And uh, environment is one of the issues that we teach them about and it becomes important to them. So uh, they themselves, with our support, support and encouragement, of course, uh, including six, seed funding sometimes and on occasions, they uh, organize different activities that range and vary from, uh, you know, very small scale cleanup activities to a larger uh, awareness raising campaigns and also local advocacy that is very important because they, uh, with the local advocacy, they can actually hold the duty bearers accountable and they can make their voices heard. So this is, this is something very important and if I have the time, I will say about the awareness rate. Yes, so we have a uh, we have a new uh, let's say new initiative uh, that we call Traveling University. Uh, that uh, with this we try to build the positive uh, narratives, counteract disinformation and misinformation, and actually reach those who are the most who live in most remote areas uh, and are more most underserved and so what we do we go to the villages together with the most prominent Georgian experts and also professors from the uh, Georgian universities and we actually talk to the youth we inform them we debunk the myths and we uh, we try to engage them in the dialogue and in discussion so this is this is the awareness raising or the building the positive part uh, uh, positive narratives part and environment is also a, a, a big part of this work. Mm, it's such a great initiative, mm, uh, really, you. it is. We're very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. Um, so Pelle, I turn to, turn to you now. You and the uh, UN Foundation, in your own words before, you said that uh, you bring together fresh thinking and diverse voices around innovative ideas to drive progress and tackle problems. And you have some of those fresh thinking voices with you here today. Uh, how can the global United Nations Associations movement contribute to spreading the ideas in uh, our Common Agenda report, uh, you think, and especially highlight the need for multilateral cooperation and on climate change? Mm. No, but I, I think this whole conference is about that question in, in a way. Um, we... Uh, in the innovative work, already tomorrow we are going to have uh, organized a roundtable where we have prepared uh, through a very interactive youth-led process a, a contract for the future, for future generations, which we will present at the Stockholm conference. Mm. And uh, there, there are some flyers out there that I put on the on the table. That uh, if you're accredited to the to the meeting, please join us for that roundtable. It's also live streamed, so you can watch all over the world. That contract is a youth contribution. We hope that there will be a ministerial uh, statement in support of working with future generations. And all of that is geared towards the Summit for the Future, which is also announced in our common agenda, uh, which will be held in September next year. And, I, and that's where I would like to come with advice or advice, you know, recommendation, because I think we need to mobilize all the resources we have in order to put pressure on decision makers. Uh, and the Summit for the Future is one of those main, main events next year. And the other one is the SDG Summit, of course. And they will happen more or less in the same time frame. And if we can mobilize around those two uh, meetings and really work at the field level, at the country level, and, and get a more interest to follow up our common agenda on all these, this comprehensive, difficult uh, agenda, uh, but to have governments feel the pressure from uh, 
uh, from the national level. I think that's that's we have this year now to really prepare for that, and and that would be my uh, encouragement to you know as much mobilization as possible for the next year. Great, thank you so much for this. So um, a big applause to this panel. <laughs> And of course, we have a little gift for you. <laughs> I think you all know what it is by now. <laughs> Thank you so much. The famous olive oil. There you Thank go. You. Thank you so much. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you Thank as you. well. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 So, dear friends, it's uh, now time for us to move over to the statement from the World Federation of United Nations Association that I uh, just recently mentioned. So, um, let's see here. We are uh, delighted to welcome uh, our State Secretary for International Development Cooperation, Miss Jenny Olson, an applause. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. I'm back. So I will need to, to have a little peek on my notes here then. So um, the thing is that I have something for you, but someone should give it so to me. So I heard. <laughs> yes, I wonder where it is. Could I please get it up on stage? Is it? There it is. Thank you. So I will soon. And over this. So, on behalf of the World Federation of the United Nations Associations, we would like to present you with a statement from the Global United Nations Association movement in connection now then with the Stockholm Plus 50 high level meeting. Uh, the statement, which has been initiated, I must say, by the United uh, Nations Association of Sweden, and we have, have also co facilitated this. Uh, has also been signed by uh, about 40 national United Nations associations. And among them, the Nordics and the five uh, UNAs who are with us here today. Uh, and those are the ones from Armenia, Finland, Georgia, Tanzania and Uganda. Uh, so if you please take this statement and the action points with you uh, for consideration at the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. Definitely. So, uh, I hope that you Thank will you. do it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll run thank back you. to the office with it now. <laughs> thank Please you. Do so so uh, a big applause and so much thank you for you to coming here today, State Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would you like to say something? Yes, Perhaps? I have been asked to say a few words. Please do I'm so. all very excited Please about so. getting that chance. Yes. Actually, I want to rip this open and read it right now, but I'll wait until afterwards. I was asked to say a few words, Please. so I'll do that. So, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, also everyone who is on the line, uh, it's such an honor uh, to be here with you. Uh, for me personally, kicking off this uh, conference with this event. Uh, this week, as we all know, it's dedicated to the commemoration of the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment and the celebration of 50 years of global environmental action. But perhaps most importantly, this week is also an opportunity, as we do now, to come together through peaceful dialogue, to jointly reflect on the urgency to advance actions to secure a better future for all and a healthy planet. So Stockholm Plus 50 conference, it aims to be a bit of a beacon of hope in a time when the world is facing multiple crises, I mean, so many crises right now. Mm. And also when the rules-based international order at the same time is being challenged. So to achieve uh, this green and just and, and inclusive transition that leaves no one behind, that we all want, we really need to be innovative and work together. And this broad ownership with all actors, it's, it's really, it can't be stressed enough how fundamental it is if we're gonna tackle these global challenges and realize the SDGs. 
to engage uh, and have meaningful participation of civil society. I mean, you've discussed it and, and I, I can only agree, it's really a key mm. uh, in this work. I mean, to, to push and propose and oppose and participate and all that force that the civil society comes with. It can't be stressed enough how important that is. So really on behalf of the Swedish government, uh, thank you for this uh, and thank you for, for uh, the active engagement, insightful engagement, and it's such an honor to receive it and uh, we look forward to studying it in more detail. I'll open it after. Uh, we're really proud actually uh, of the inclusive process of Stockholm Plus 50. I mean it's not only government, it is civil society, business also and, and young people in general. Uh, maybe you knew this number, but I mean through this uh, special youth task force and through over 230 dialogue meetings and 46 thousand people from all over the world have been involved. 46,000 people, that's a, a big number. And with the formation of UNEP, the adoption of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda, to name just a few, I mean, we should be aware of this in institutional progress that has actually been made since 1972. It's really important to the re remember that that has been a progress institutionally. Uh, but of course, we all know, you definitely all know that uh, more needs to be done and time is running out so fast. Mm. So, but again, and perhaps most importantly, uh, I mean, we all know where we're heading. We all know what we need to do to get there. So ahead of uh, COP15 and COP27, we think that Stockholm Plus 50 will be an agenda setting moment to on this path towards this common destination, which is of course a world which we recalibrate the relationship with nature and also pursue sustainable and just consumption and production patter patterns. It was really interesting in the presentation mm -hmm. uh, just earlier. Uh, the conference, it will connect uh, climate and environmental action with development and the well-being of future generations and what we all say, leaving no one behind. I mean, this is it. So it will mobilize government, civil society, business, other key stakeholders towards this green, just and also inclusive transition. So um, we hope it will accelerate the joint commitments that we have and also generate new action, raised ambition and also innovative uh, financing opportunities and solutions. So uh, thank you so much for this day that you've arranged. I looked at the program. I wish I was here all day actually. <laughs> and, and best wishes for the remainder of the week. Everyone will be very active, I'm sure. So looking forward to seeing some of you out also at the conference. Thank you for this. Thank you so much, State Secretary. Thank you so much for coming and taking the time. Thank you. So, thank you. So, um, we are approaching the end of these two days. And I would now like to invite on the stage uh, Mr. Reynal Maeda. Um, please come up for some final reflections. Just shortly, there's been quite a race, so I suggest we sit down. <laughs> Um, so, two days, and you have listened to, uh, to all the sessions, all the speakers. Um, so, I, I wonder what reflections, just shortly, you have from these two days. Yes, um, I must say it, it has been really inspiring. And since it's a people's reflection, I have uh, four of my, uh, uh, it's a people's perspective, I have four of my favorite quotes uh, uh, from the two days. Um, one is that uh, sustainability is a journey mm -hmm. uh, that requires uh, boldness, patience, and determination. Um, the other one was uh, small steps matter when it comes to climate action. You know, the power of one mm -hmm. and its uh, accumulative uh, uh, effect. The other one is about intergenerational justice. Um, the fact that decisions that we make now have a huge uh, effect mm. on the future of the planet and the future generations. The last one was uh, from the youth a statement mm. that it's time to walk the talk. Uh, times to it's time to take action. So for me, from a people's perspective, uh, the two days uh, we all agree that 
it's time to take action and it's time to be considerate of not only ourselves and our generation, but we need to consider uh, future generations. Mm. Thank you so much for this well chosen uh, quote, uh, I must say. So, uh, dear friends, um, we have reached the end of these days. And I would like to, to thank all uh, of those who have um, been here, both the panelists, but most of all, the fantastic staff who have arranged this event, and especially one person, Malin Aubrey Ås, who have worked so hard with this. So a big applause to her. Um, I hope that you have found these, day, in these days rewarding and interesting in various ways and uh, that you have gotten new insights uh, and ideas also for future work. And you are more than welcome to engage in the uh, United Nations uh, Association of Sweden's work on climate. You can easily become a member. Just visit our webpage fn.se slash medlem. And if you want to, to join a local chapter, because there are like 70 local chapters uh, all around Sweden, from Haparanda in the north to Ystad in the south, you're more than welcome to, to engage there. It would be very much appreciated. Um, I know also that we have an author here somewhere. Uh, we have the lovely posters. Uh, I wonder if he would like to come up on stage. He's on his way. So here he comes. <laughs> he would like to say some words. Yes, my name is uh, Tommy Bengtsson, and I had only got uh, two years in school for learn English, so I'm not so very good on it, but I shall uh, do what I can so everybody understand. Uh, yes, like uh, Anneli said here, so uh, I work with the children for over 50 years, and I am a painter and learn children to paint in the school, and the post is just, just sitting around her a little. Uh, so it's nice, we had a, had a very good work together with you, uh, Swedish uh, FN for Bundet, <laughs> what you call it. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy, and the children, of course, very, very happy. I work for them, and I do what I can. And uh, now this day has come here. We just uh, bring, finish our third books. The first one, we live in Copenhagen, 09, and after that in Paris to the environment minister, 200. And now we are here in Stockholm. So we are very taksamma, what do you say? Grateful. <laughs> Grateful, okay, for to uh, be here with all the people who had been here, sitting and listen and everybody who stay here and talk about the problems we have on the earth just now. And I think when everybody works what we do, we shall fix it so kids uh, can be safe for living on the earth together overall. So now I want to leave two books here, I think it's right books. I had uh, paint a little in it too. And if somebody are interested to buy it, you can buy it for 250 Swedish kron, and the money go direct to the next book. Yeah, and it's a, I, it's a really good book. You can look here later. Uh, it's a over 100 picture from kids from three years old up to eight. And uh, here I can read its wrong book. <laughs> it was I, I think that maybe you can explain them more. Um, uh, but I will give to you now 
Uh, I begin with uh, Marlin Orbe. Oz, can you come up here? For all the work you had done this week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Anneli. Oh. You shall get one too. And that's for you. Oh, thank you so much. Very okay. kind of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank, so. thank you for asking me to come up here. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Good luck with those. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Good luck to us all with saving the earth. And thank, thank you again all so much for coming here today. And uh, the best of luck to, uh, with the work for a sustainable future. So uh, again, have a nice evening and thanks a lot. Mm.